land is burning and our homes are flooding. The air we breathe is killing us. People are losing their jobs. Climate disruption is our reality now. And it's hitting the most vulnerable hardest. It's time. Time to clean up our act. Ashton has scoured the globe to find the front runners in the race to halt the climate crisis and create a fairer world. It's time to put people and the planet first. These are the people across the world already taking rapid action to halt the climate crisis. They're the front runners in the climate decade. They're showing us a new way, a way to build back better. Together, we're taking on the world's most urgent threat, the climate crisis. Now is the time to roll up our sleeves and take action. Will you join us? Hello and welcome to the first ever virtual Ashton Awards. As the world battles on with the coronavirus pandemic, action on the climate crisis mustn't slow down. It can't. We must redouble our efforts and ensure that we build back better. Build back society and the economy in a way that's better for the planet and for our children. I'm Julia Bradbury and I've been presenting TV shows that bring nature into the living rooms of people in Britain, from the UK and around the world for the past 25 years. I'm passionate about protecting our planet, which is why I love Ashton's focus on solutions for a better future. The people at the forefront of climate innovation and solutions are this year's 11 Ashton leaders, and they've all got great stories to tell us. They're building better homes and safer streets, creating new jobs and opportunities for women entrepreneurs, giving communities the power they need and creating the systems we need to build more resilient societies. Since we can't be together in person this year, sharing celebratory hugs and stealing each other's after dinner mints, we're going virtual with the awards. You'll hear from all of our winners and some very special guest speakers. But first, here's Ashton's CEO, Harriet Lamb. Hello, everyone. As we set off this climate decade, we must imagine and create new ways of running our societies and economies. That takes imaginative and creative people who are fashioning cutting edge solutions. People like this year's Ashton Award winners. These and the hundreds of leaders with whom we've worked over 20 years are the experts by experience. And they give us a much needed dose of hope. They know how to get people out of their cars and onto bikes, how to power up communities and create livelihoods for the vulnerable while giving us the better low carbon society where well, I know I'd rather live. These front runners have the power to propel us down the pathway to zero, but they need the right investment, support and policies. That's why we're experimenting with how to get more finance to the sector, like our new fair cooling fund that will invest in cool ways to cool people down. And we're raising these champions' voices along with our own. So I hope you like our bold new style. We distill their expertise into tools to share so that others can steal their ideas with pride, like our toolkit for local authorities packed full of initiatives that cut carbon and benefit people directly with warmer homes or lower fuel bills. Or like our research, on how ensuring women benefit when solar energy reaches their villages and their homes. Watch out for our exciting campaign with a wide coalition to help our schools commit to play their part in reaching zero carbon by 2030 while calling on government for the extra resources. I can't wait to find the greenest school in the land and I hope you'll join us. We thank all of you, partners, trusts, foundations, companies and individuals for your support and long-term funding which is helping realise our vision. The global pandemic has shown how governments and all of us can change at scale and speed. Now is the time 
to clean up our act on climate change, to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty while restarting our battered economies. And these Ashton pioneers give us the building blocks, brick by brick, to a just recovery and a just transition. And who better to talk to us about that than Sharon Burrow, who's Secretary General of the International Trade Union Confederation, representing a phenomenal 207 million workers in 163 countries and territories. Welcome, Sharon. So uh, listening today, we have people from bankers to community groups, charity, government, major brands and small entrepreneurs at the cutting edge of innovation. What are the concrete steps that you think people can take to help support that just transition, that green recovery in the future? What can we all do? Well, we have uh, 37 trillion dollars of workers' capital, our pension funds invested in the global economy. So we asked the bankers and the investors amongst your audience to make sure that they're investing in companies who are making the transition, who support uh, fundamental rights, human rights but, uh, and labour rights, but also who support a sustainable future. That's the first thing, because we don't want stranded assets, but we don't want stranded people or communities as well, and we'll fight against that. And the investor community to date, or well, some of them are very good, the bulk hasn't done enough. We want to see uh, communities involved, because you can't just walk away from a community. We've done that for decades. That's not just. We need to give whole communities hope that there are jobs and there are future for the children and the grandchildren to sustain, you know, the living standards that they, the, the lifestyle and the living standards that they would choose. And then, of course, you know, in, in the community itself, we're going to try and bring the elements of this crisis together with a first conversation on June 24th. And we hope people will join us in a global day of action around discussions between workers and employers about how to climate and employment proof the workplace. So getting that local conversation, building a movement of people to actually demand that the when the COP happens now in November 2021, that we don't let governments off the hook. We actually demand ambitious, national de, um, determined contributions that have just transition at the centre. You talked then, actually, which is exactly how, how we see it, that you need to build locally and really community-led initiatives or city-led initiatives, and then we need them connecting up to a global vision. But sometimes it feels like that international cooperation, when we need it the most, is perhaps not as strong as we would like. Is that something, how can we help rebuild that sense of global responsibility to really tackle the climate crisis and in particular in solidarity with those countries in the front line? Well, you're right. Global solidarity is in tatters. And I can tell you, if you think back to that uh, figures, those figures of destitution, we are projected to spend around 10 trillion in this phase of the crisis. As we move to recovery, we will probably double that or more. And yet getting 37 billion committed on a global solidarity base to build universal social protection for the 28 poorest countries is looking like a dream at the moment, although we are determined to make this happen. So, you know, we built global funds for AIDS, for malaria, for tuberculosis, goodness gracious, if there was a time to put a guarantee of universal social protection, the floor of a social contract, and then, of course, to build decent work from jobs that we invest in that are sustainable jobs, it's now. But multilateralism is in tatters. We need reform of the Bretton Woods institutions. We can no longer align debt, for example, or debt suspension or relief with uh, terrible austerity conditionality. We need to align it with the Sustainable Development Goals and investment in the Sustainable Development Goals. We need to rethink debt to build a fund for resilience. So the next crisis that hits, we have social protection, 
We have uh, the contract advances that you've seen made with unions and government and civil society working to advance paid sick leave, to advance income guarantees, to look at what it meant for business continuity where wages and benefits were paid to workers. And we'll see some bumpy days ahead as we figure out how to share work and maximise income, how to build jobs. But in 2015, Harriet, the world made promises to people. The SDGs, the Paris Climate Agreement, that's the recipe for a zero poverty, zero carbon world. And we need those leaders to get their heads above their nation state and say that's still the recipe. Do what you need to do for your own people, absolutely, but let's make sure we do it on a global basis because that's the only thing in an interdependent world that will bring some measure of social and climate justice. Sharon, thank you very much for sharing your vision of a zero poverty, zero carbon world that we can all work towards together. Thank you, Harriet. So here are our first three award winners. As we heard from Sharon and Harriet, our recovery from the pandemic is a once in a generation imperative to move away from our high carbon past and into a more low carbon future. To make the most of this, we must ensure that every subsidy, every government policy, every business investment, every dollar we spend as citizens is invested in rebuilding a different economy and society, all powered by clean energy that's available to everyone. Each of our first three 2020 winners knows what's possible when local and national governments put the needs of its citizens first. Only this level of ambition and groundbreaking action will rapidly achieve the scale of carbon cuts that we all urgently need. Our first award category is Raising Ambition. The award for System Innovation for Energy Access, supported by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, goes to Togolese Rural Electrification and Renewable Energy Agency. Je suis chez Gounbakari, euh, conseiller du président de la République. Il y a d'abord eu la vision du président de dire « Je veux atteindre l'électrification pour tous d'ici 2030 et je veux que ce soit une électrification qui soit respectueuse de l'environnement. » On a pris le temps de construire des bases solides et aujourd'hui on est dans la phase de déploiement de tout cela. Pour chaque village, on est allé calculer ce qu'on appelle le « least cost of electricity ». Mais où il y a une faible densité de population et donc pour lesquelles il n'y a pas de sens d'amener le réseau. Donc ce seront sûrement des kits solaires en fait. Il y a par contre des villages qui sont éloignés du réseau mais où il y a une forte densité de population où on va mettre des mini-grilles. On s'est aussi rendu compte qu'il y a des gens qui vivent dans des zones où il y a l'électricité aujourd'hui mais qui n'ont pas accès à l'électricité et donc soit raccordé euh, euh, au réseau au réseau national. Le président a décidé de mettre en place en fait un fonds pour l'électrification des ménages et donc aujourd'hui au Togo tous les ménages ruraux qui décident de passer du kérosène ou de la bougie au kit solaire ont tous les mois une subvention de 4 dollars par mois. On veut que tout le monde ait accès à l'électricité. The award for Sustainable Mobility International, sponsored by Bank of America, goes to the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy in India for the Chennai Mega Streets program. I'm Shreya Garepalli and I live in Chennai in India. I lead the South Asia program of the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. A decade back, there were more or less no footpaths. But with our technical assistance in 2014, Chennai became the first Indian city to take the bold step of adopting a policy that mandated that at least 60% of transport investments go into initiatives to improve walking and cycling. Since then, we've helped the city in creating over 120 kilometers of footpaths, including a vibrant pedestrian plaza right in the heart of the city. 
we've also assisted the city in envisioning and launching a public bicycle sharing system. So what used to be a street choked with traffic is today a pedestrian promenade of international standards. Chennaiites love it, they are proud of it, and the state government is so excited about it that it has plans to implement similar transformations in cities across the whole state. The award for Cool Cities, supported by KSEP and Climate Works, goes to the Natural Resources Defence Council for the Ahmedabad Heat Action Plan. My name is Dr. Tejas Shah. I am a Deputy Health Officer and as well I am looking after Heat Action Plan in Ahmedabad City. In 2010, there was a heat wave in Ahmedabad and the temperature reached beyond 46 degrees. It was a deadly heat wave. We didn't have any system, so we have implemented the heat action plan in 2013. We track each and every reported heat stroke case and put it on the map to identify vulnerable zones across the city. During the summer months, we are issuing alerts when the temperature is going to be beyond 45 degrees centigrade. It, we will call it red alert. We are using multiple ways to reach people. Electronic media, print media, radio jingles, and we are sending our grassroots level workers to the areas in which the most vulnerable people are living during the red alert period. We are changing the timings of the schools. We are making sure that there are no power cuts. We are distributing water in all of our bus depots and patients. And our hospitals are very much ready. We have also developed some cool roof system across the city. Nowadays, many cities and many states have adopted heat action plan, and many cities are getting benefits from that. Our three amazing stories that show what visionary thinking, coupled with clear policy making and action and delivery, can achieve. We've built a world powered by fossil fuels, which puts big corporations in the driving seat but a world powered by renewables, especially at local level, offers the potential to put power in the hands of the people. So here are two stories of people power, communities coming together and finding ways of democratizing and sharing energy so that everyone benefits, including the most vulnerable. Our next award category is sharing power. The award for finance and business model innovation for energy access, supported by City, goes to SolShare in Bangladesh. Our name is Abdul Jalil Bhaiyapari. I am from Bangladesh. As for the three months ago, I am from the Pashi Gram in Bazar. I know solar box from there. এটা আমার সোল বক্স প্রতিবেশী সকলের আছে আগে যে বিদ্যুৎ ছিল সেটার দাম ছিল অনেক বেশি সেটা দিয়ে আমরা একটা লাইট ব্যবহার করতে পারতাম বর্তমানে সোল শেয়ার যে বিদ্যুৎ আমরা ব্যবহার করি সেটা দিয়ে অনেকগুলো লাইট ফ্যান ইত্যাদি জিনিস ব্যবহার করা যায় এবং বিক্রিও করা যায় আগে বিদ্যুতের দাম অনেক বেশি ছিল বিদায় আমরা একটি লাইট অথবা একটি ফ্যান ব্যবহার করতে পারতাম বর্তমানে সোল শেয়ার মাধ্যমে আমরা বিদ্যুৎ সাশ্রয় পেয়েছি এবং অনেক লাইট অনেক ফ্যান ইত্যাদি জিনিস ব্যবহার করতে পারি আমার অতিরিক্ত বিদ্যুৎ আমার প্রতিবেশী আমার থেকে কিনে নেয় The award for humanitarian energy goes to the United Nations Development Program in Yemen. اسمي إيمان غالب هادي الحملي مديرة محطة مشروع صديقات البيئة للطاقة الشمسية. خوف خجل كذلك تردد لكن بما بعد هذا المشروع بعد هذا المشروع اعتماد على النفس الثقة لأن كفتيات خريجات ليس لدينا فرصة أمل. ونعيل الأسرة كذلك هذه الدورة التدريبية لمدة 20 يوم فيها الدورات التدريبية عملنا دراسات حول المنازل المحتاجة للكهرباء عملنا دراسة كذلك عن التكاليف 
المطلوبة للطاقة الشمسية أول مشروع في مديرية أبس صح لأن واجهنا صعوبات في دراستها كأول كمبتدأ لنا كمبدئيا لعشرين شخص بنوصل طبعا رسالتي أنا لكل فتيات أبس أو في محافظة حجة أو في كل محافظات اليمن أن يسعوا لتحقيق رغباتهم أن يسعوا لتحقيق أحلامهم وطموحات Two powerful and moving examples of how communities are organizing themselves to benefit everyone, even when faced with seemingly insurmountable challenges. This is the kind of thinking we need to apply to all of our communities, from the smallest village to the largest city. Our cities present some of the greatest challenges and opportunities when it comes to climate solutions. In the UK, buildings already account for over a third of our annual carbon emissions, but we've also got a housing crisis. So we need to find a way to build affordable, safe homes that are low carbon in construction and in use. Urban populations are at the greatest risk of air pollution. So to create clean, healthy cities, we need to speed up alternatives to polluting vehicles as well. Our next winners are leading the way to create sustainable, livable cities for everyone. Our third award category is Building Back Better. The award for Sustainable Built Environment UK, supported by Garfield Western Foundation, goes to Passive House Homes. My name is Nigel Bowley. I am a carpenter builder. Currently I'm working on a passive house. I wanted an exciting project. PH Homes, they provide everything. The frame turns up as a flat pack with a huge set of drawings. The windows are pre-made, off-site, delivered to site. The great thing about this house is using natural materials and because of the way it's insulated and the way it retains the heat, you won't need to use the heating. I would recommend it to friends and clients because it's environmentally friendly and it provides a very simple process to build a house. Well, it's like an IKEA wardrobe, isn't it? The award for Energy Innovation UK, supported by Impax, goes to Guru Systems. I'm Casey Cole and I'm the CEO of Guru Systems. The biggest carbon problem in the UK is heating. It's responsible for about a third of all emissions. We use technology and software as a service to address the biggest problems on heat networks. So if you're a local authority or a housing association or a private developer, you have to have good data about how heat's being consumed and how the plant is generating that heat. And that's what our system does. The operator of the energy system understands exactly where problems are. They can spot them early and fix them fast. This is the device that lives in each dwelling on a heat network. And it shows customers exactly what their account balance is, how much they've used, and some of those customers are least able to pay. Customers get better information and lower cost heat because the system's more efficient. The award for Clean Air in Towns and Cities UK, supported by HSBC UK, goes to eCargo Bikes. My name is Andreas Algren and I'm a rider slash hub supervisor here at eCargo Bikes. As a cycle courier company, we're much more energy efficient than any other form of transport. It's better to deliver on a cargo bike because it's cleaner, faster, and the customers are just happy to see the shopping arriving on a bike. So Co-op is our main client currently. We also have collaborations with the local authorities delivering parcels. 
we're employed on a full contract, which is a good way to work because you're not stressing, you're not trying to jump the red lights, take a necessary risk just to get your job done on time. My favorite part of the job is actually arriving to the customer's house with the groceries, just to see a big smile on their face. So. It's with real excitement that I welcome Zamzam Ibrahim to speak to us today. Zamzam is the president of the NUS and she's a vital voice in the climate movement. Here she is to give her perspective on student climate activism and the global climate crisis. Young people today are growing up in a world radically different to the one that we were born into. When you look around today where the climate disaster is never off our screens and why political leaders across the globe siddle up to climate change deniers and where we've been taught to accept the inevitable destruction of our planet and with this crisis that we find ourselves in now, where the nation are clapping for essential workers simultaneously seen as disposable, we really have to ask ourselves why this is. And no matter how you approach the issue, the issue is always systematic. You can't fix a problem if you can't identify its root. I really believe our leaders are making bad decisions are making bad decisions because they were badly educated. Our schools, our colleges, our universities, our education factories are more interested in preparing us to pass our exams than developing us as critical thinkers and as global citizens. Think about it. We're assessed on what we can remember, not what we can do with our knowledge. Our education system teaches us to compete with our rivals, not to collaborate with our friends. We're led to believe that sustainability is this niche subject, not something that is fundamental to everything that we learn and do. Our education system teaches us in silos, even though everything is connected. We leave education with so much debt that we feel obliged to apply for the best paid jobs rather than the jobs that will make the world a better place. The whole system teaches us to prioritise short-term profit over long-term prosperity. David Orr, an academic and activist, said, it isn't the world's poorest and least, well -edu least educated people that are doing the most damage. It's those with BSCs, MBAs, PhDs, and I could not agree more. Our environmental NGOs and international NGOs are constantly fighting bad decisions made by well-educated people. The student strikers in Japan recently likened it to a game of bash the mole, and I see what they mean. As soon as we get rid of one urgent problem, like fracking, another one pops up, like Heathrow, the Amazon fires, and we all have to stop, jump on to stop it. Constantly fighting bad decisions made by well-educated people is exhausting. And for this reason, our Teach the Future campaign, supported by Ashton Foundation, is key. And I was so excited to launch the first bill written by young people in Parliament earlier this year. We've seen young people around the globe mobilise, building movements of movements that recognises that the fight fought in silos is a battle already lost. We as a movement are not only about dismantling barriers in our curriculum. We dismantle barriers in every facet of society. Internationalism is key in this fight and the recognition that the actions taken by the global north is paid by the global south. We know that we can change the formal and informal curriculums through our campaigns and programmes, but the subliminal, subliminal curriculum requires capital investment. Updating and upgrading our learning spaces should be a national infrastructure priority because we don't just learn in these buildings, we learn from these buildings. Imagine if every new educational building, school and campus was net zero by 2020 and every existing building was net zero by 2030. And I'm so excited to be working in coalition with Ashton to achieve this. I guess to end, as young people, we've always been at the forefront of transformative campaigns. We rise to the challenges ahead. We stand ready to mobilise, to organise, to protest, to march and to strike for a better planet. We're here to change the world and we remain pretty unapologetic about that. The incredible Zamzam Ibrahim there. So far we've put the spotlight on better policy making, better buildings and better transport. Now let's turn to another vital component in building back better, better work. Providing opportunities for people, especially women, to earn a living in a dignified, sustainable way is essential to building more resilient communities. Communities that can cope with crises like coronavirus or disasters caused by climate change. Our next two winners are doing just that. Here is our fourth category of working better. The award for Sustainable Built Environment Global, supported by Grosvenor, goes to Build Up Nepal. Namaskar, my name is Meena O. Melamchi. There was a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of money, a lot of money. And there was a lot of money, a lot of money. There was a lot of money, and there was a lot of money. Ooh, you're taller than I'm. I'm not 
तर पहिला सुरुमा त्यो इटा बनाउने बेलामा चाहिँ कसरी बनाउने होला कसरी झिक्ने होला जस्तो हुन्थ्यो हुन्थ्यो के थाहा नभएर के नजानेर एक दिन आएर एकछिन सिकाइदिनु भएको कि त्यो मिसिन फिट गरेको बेलामा एकछिन सिकाइदिनु भएको है हामीले त्यो एकैछिन नजानिहाल्यो त्यो इटाको घर भन्दा त यो घर सस्तो हो अब रङ्गिली टाइम साइन कसरी छ फल उर अब पहिलाको घर त त्यसो त अलिक भन्दा यो त थाम्छ होला The award for energy and livelihoods supported by the Waterloo Foundation goes to S4S Technologies in India. My name is Nidhi Pan. I'm the co-founder of S4S Technologies. In India, there is a lot of problems with food waste. From your farm to your marketplace, there are a lot of losses due to storage, handling, transportation, and this leads to around 40% waste in the entire supply chain. We have developed a solar conduction dryer using sustainable solar technology, which we deploy at the farm to reduce the food waste. It increases the shelf life of the perishable produce, converting them into non-perishable. We work with landless women farmers dependent on rain-fed agriculture, training them to be women entrepreneurs, providing them a short additional income. Now we've got something really special for you. Rakea Fatuga is a creative writer and a poet based in London. In 2017, she won the Spread the Word Young People's Laureate for London Poetry Awards. And in 2018, she was shortlisted for the Outspoken Poetry Prize and she won the Roundhouse Poetry Slam. Here she is performing her spoken word, Enterprise. Welcome, Rakea. Hi, I'm Rakea Fatuga and I'm going to share two poems with you. The first is called When Asked How Her People Would Fight for Tomorrow. She said today, I have already been in emergency birthed children and waded in it, chin deep in crisis, the surface shimmering like oil on a polluted sea. The pedestals of place, possession or privilege kept you dry, gave you time to overlook my poverty, placelessness, persecution, a height that let you call it someone else's fight, someone else's ocean. Even when it glimmered by your side, even when it thrashed and drowned your neighbours, now, crisis laps against your shoe, wets your child's feet, and you realise how small they are, and even you, no one is too tall to feel, no one is too safe to fear, to look in the face of the past, its foaming, rising waves unruly like the future, to look in the face of it and call it emergency. This next poem is called Enterprise. As the climate changes, the finance we refused will seem small. It costs more to mend a body wrecked than to break its fall. Now that our body is falling, flailing limbs of blue and juniper green dropping to the jaws of a hurricane, the leg will suffer what the foot has done, and the arm, the hand, and the shoulder, the neck, the waters and land are foreboded wreck. Mitigation and money are sisters. Together they'll nurse the world, mending the cracks, aligning the spine and supporting the back, caring for the seas as they meet with the skies, knowing where to begin raising clean enterprise like open palms that say tomorrow will be better if we prepare for it today. Throughout my career, I've championed the natural world and I believe now more than ever, we have to put nature first. Countries in lockdown have seen wildlife return to empty streets, canals and riverways. City dwellers have heard birdsong usually drowned out by traffic noise and they've been able to breathe in cleaner air for the first time in decades. Nature has the power to heal, to cool our warming planet, to clean our air and to keep everything in balance. It's our duty to protect it for our children and our children's children. 
Our final film tells a remarkable story of how indigenous people in Brazil are working with solutions that are right for their community and right for nature. Watch and learn. The award for Natural Climate Solutions, supported by the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, goes to Reed de Sementes Dozingu. Eu sou a Bruna Ferreira, moro em Canarana, no estado de Mato Grosso, no Brasil. Sou bióloga e diretora da rede de sementes do Xingu. Antes da rede de sementes do Xingu, não existia um, um diálogo entre as comunidades e os proprietários rurais. Quem compra sementes hoje são proprietários rurais, organizações da sociedade civil que têm projetos para restauração florestal, em 13 anos de existência, até hoje, a gente já viabilizou sementes para restaurar 6 mil hectares de áreas degradadas. A rede de sementes hoje ela tem 565 coletores. Historicamente, as mulheres são elas que vão para a mata fazer a coleta de sementes, posteriormente o beneficiamento. A técnica da semeadura direta ela já existia, ela é efetiva, dá grandes resultados e apresenta uma maior diversidade nas áreas implementadas. Essa iniciativa, ela, ao mostrar que existe uma alternativa de renda vinda da floresta, e isso mostra a juventude que eles podem sim ter uma alternativa é, para além do desmatamento, para além de ter que queimar, ela mostra que é, a gente pode manter, essas comunidades podem manter, devem manter essa floresta em pé. This is a unique opportunity to make changes for the future of our planet. The impossible has happened. The world has paused, the earth has taken a deep breath, and we've seen nature come back into all of our lives. The world from towns and cities to villages and hamlets has a renewed appreciation of nature and I think an understanding of how vital it is to our very survival. The Indian author Arundhati Roy recently said, historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This one is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. She offers us hope, as do all of our winners. So before we say goodbye, let's hear from this year's new Ashton leaders. The choices that we make every day has a lasting impact, not just on our future, but the future of generations to come. To work towards halting the climate crisis is to focus equally on societal sustainability and environmental sustainability. We need to find particularly energy solutions that work at the community level. The problem mundial dessa emergência climática nos faz querer criar soluções para minimizar o impacto da população. To protect the environment not only for us but for the future generations as well. Climate change impacts detrimentally the poorest who are least responsible the most. The need for climate action is urgent and is now because it's no longer a distant threat. We as energy entrepreneurs really have to learn how to work together more effectively with the government. When, when all logic tells you to give up, that's when you continue, you persist. Time has come for action and address climate change now. We must ensure that our climate innovation puts our most vulnerable users at the heart of transformation. You want to make real change? Never, ever give up. <laughs>